I can hear you. Okay, good, good. Well, can well, you hear me? We can hear you really well. Welcome to the show. We're on live. Well, if I, if in fact I'm on it, I'm, I'm hearing you from over there. But uh, yeah, okay, we're good. We're, we're. Oh, um, shut that down. We're, we're. Here we are. Anyway, Henry Gross, thank you. Uh, this is we just interviewed you for a second time. Uh, for a, a lot of folks know Henry uh, from Shannon and Springtime Mama, but he's released over twenty albums. Uh, was the youngest. You were you were the youngest guy on the main stage at uh, with Shana at, at Woodstock. It's all true. It's all true. I'm guilty as charged. By the way, do you remember any of that show? Yes, I do. Um, because, um, you know, I was never one of the great imbibers. And so, uh, you know, they, well, actually, that's not true. And that's a whole other story. They say, if you can remember Woodstock, you weren't there. But I, uh, I was told years later, I remembered getting in a car with Jerry Garcia driving to the stage and, uh, but, uh, and watching Joe Cocker. But I, a friend of mine that was in my first band who was doing security in the backstage actually told me that I spent the entire day with Jerry Garcia. It's the kind of thing I'd have bragged about. And so that tells you that perhaps I was really there. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I just want to let the folks know that, first of all, Henry and I did a video earlier this week where we talked about every track from Too Clever for My Own Good. And you know how much I love this album, Henry. And you were most kind. One of my Although favorite albums the last five the years. Album. By the way, we go through every single track in the description of this video that you're watching right now. There's a link to Henry's website where you can pick up the new album. Also a link to that track by track if you want to get a, a, a feel for the songs. They're on there as well. And Henry, you'll sign them. There, he, there it is. <laughs> there it is. See? There it is. In the flesh. But you see, the only reason uh, that, uh, that John has me on the show is because his wife is named Shannon. And, it, you know, and he's trying to score points. I get it. And I'm happy to do it for you. I, you know, I'm happy to be your your song pimp, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Gross, John Bowden's song pimp. <laughs> well, listen, I'll quickly say this. Uh, I told Henry this story, and, and uh, I, I've always been a I've always been a big fan of of your work. But a psychic once told me I was going to meet a girl that was like a song, and her name is Shannon. And I'm saying she knew. Henry Gross, I'm saying she knew. I'm telling you, this is what it is. It's good karma. It's good karma all around. And you've been nothing. And I don't tell you, I, I have been all day long getting phone calls, seriously, about the interview. People really do, did love it. And, and that, you know, I thought it, you did, whatever you did to edit my nonsense was really terrific. So, you know, now we're sounding like a talk show going, I really love you. No, I love you. <laughs> Shannon, you no, got to. Uh, I do have a first great. question. Henry, um, yes? have you ever toured uh, with Dr. Hook? Wow, I have I did shows with Dr. Hook. I remember one in Washington D.C. at the Convention Hall. Dennis LeCourier is one of my closest friends, and he is living in uh, oh, what's the name of that little town in England? Well, it does, you know. Anyway, Dennis is great. He's had a little uh, problems. He's been a little ill this year. Had to cancel his tour, but he's okay. And uh, you know, Dennis is at least in my opinion. Um, one of the great singers on the planet. I mean, he, you know, Dr. Hook was kind of taken lightly because, well, they did a lot of those wonderful Shel Silverstein songs, but uh, Shel was, of course, everybody's idol who ever read a Playboy magazine and read the, you know, where the sidewalk ends. But uh, uh, Dennis, really, he's singing Sylvia's Mother. I mean, who else in the world could have sung Sylvia's Mother and made you love it? I mean, De Dennis, every note you're waiting, you can't believe him. What a singer, what a great guy too. I love Dennis LeCourier, so you're asking the right guy. Any other questions about Dennis? I'm happy. He's, he's a lunatic. If Dennis were on the show, you would think, oh, Henry's not as crazy as you said. Dennis is crazy because he visits the earth. And the two of us, did. we were, we were in the, at the Royal Albert Hall doing Joe Brown's 50th anniversary in show business show. And we were both on the show. We shared a dressing room and everybody else was British. And, you know, mad dogs and Englishmen. But we showed them that the Americans are truly the crazy ones. <laughs> we, we, you know, we, we, we just had a, too much fun. You, and he is no, sorry. singing with Dan is one of life's serious pleasures. Okay, the next question is, what songs did you write for Ronnie Hillsap? Uh, Millsap. Millsap. Yeah. Millsap. Oh, Ronnie Millsap never released a song of mine, but there was a song that I that I wrote. I was writing it with Roger Cook, 
And when Blackhawk, the country band, was, you know, really in their heyday on Arista Records, and Henry Paul, as I may have mentioned to you, is one of my closest friends in the world. And, you know, Henry Paul and Jonathan Edwards and I had a, uh, ha had a trio together, which we called the Vereens, because we thought Ben Vereen was this amazing en entertainer. We do, seriously. I mean, the guy sings, dances. I mean, he's like the Sammy Davis of his time. Junior, and so we love Ben Vereen. So we did this group called the Vereens, and we would say the Vereens are looking for a few good fans. So anyway, I, I, he they, they so and John was here today, you know. So it just he stuck. We did, we didn't he didn't come inside, so we did not go near each other. But he came over with his wife. So Han, I was sitting there with Roger, and we were writing a song that went. Uh, comes in and we've got this one of the verse and Henry Paul we're looking for a bridge and he comes in and he we're looking for a line and Henry opens the door to my little studio in Nashville and doesn't even say hello and goes a guy with his wife wishing he was alone everybody here wants to take you home and you know, he had that first line and we're all lined up just to wait and not turn nobody leaving here until we learn Anyway, we had a great time. So there's Henry Paul, and he threw down, and Roger Cook, who I wrote so with, and uh, and uh, the other one, uh, Sunlight So Bright on this record, and endless other ones. And so we have a little pack of people, and I don't remember the question, but it led me to the to my buddies, Roger Ronnie and Ronnie Millsap. Ronnie Millsap. So Millsap sang it, that song, and did a great job, but it never came out. Oh. <laughs> and I have a copy of it. But, but anyway, he sang it. So there, take that. Take you know, I'm very happy because Ronnie Millsap is so fantastic. I mean, yeah. God, what a singer. What a player. I mean, he's just great. Yeah. I've got, the, I've got the next question for you. How do you compare your voice range today from the 70s? How do I compare what? Your voice range today, today from the 70s. Well, I used to be able to hit the notes really high. Now I wear tighter underwear. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's fairly honest, you know, I mean, they used to wear the boxers and now I'm into the, you know, the jockey. So, uh, no, I, I haven't. Well, you tell me. And I'm sitting in a chair, not warmed up. Shannon is gonna go. She's drifting That's not something you want to do in a chair. I mean, but, I, but, but we're still okay. You know, I stay. I, I'm a guy that you know really went through the the 60s and 70s. My dad was a pharmacist, and and I got to see just how how crazy um, you know um, a chemical uh, help was to the human body, and tried to stay away from it. So I, you know, I, I'm not innocent, but I'm certainly not convictable in my generation. I mean, no one would notice whatever I did. So, yeah, I try and stay in shape. We walk five miles a day, my wife and I, you know, we're not the, sh we're not Mr. Schwarzenegger, but we are, uh, we're making a reasonable facsimile of an attempt to be uh, survivors. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. Shit. Okay. Next question. While you wrote the song about Carl Wilson's dog, you also wrote a song that Carl Wilson could sing question did Carl ever sing your song no no it was funny because I wrote it about the experience I had which we all know you know I was at his house and 
and and we were talking and his two of he had these big husky dogs and they and they ate this beautiful buffet that was set up and it was and I and he was he just kept apologizing. I said, Carl, don't worry about it. I have a crazy Irish setter at home, and you know and, and uh, you know he, he he told me that he had a dog he loved very much that was hit by a car, and killed only a short time before. The dog ran out of the house, got run over on on Coldwater Canyon. Anyway, so I, when I got home, I was sitting with my Shannon and thought about it and wrote the song. But I want, so I, you know, you remember, I don't know if you, you must remember, but back then, you won't remember, Shannon, but you might. The, the cassette machines were the size of a shoebox. Sony had a cassette machine. It was the first, you know, first good one, but it was, you know, like a, a, a box. And, and so I had one of those so I wouldn't lose ideas, which was a miracle for songwriters, you know, because all of a sudden, all those great ideas you thought were great ideas, whatever, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but you could actually record them, which was fantastic. So I had sat down and really more or less sang the song and, and made a couple of little changes. It did not take, it took me 15 minutes to write the song. And, you know, you channel these things, you know, it's like, I've, you ever hear people say that, well, okay, some people are watching us right now. But there's all these other channels that are on everywhere. I mean, there's, they're all going through us and they're everywhere. And it's it's just our perception. People can zero in on whatever they want to zero in on in this world. There's a million pictures out there. This is one of them. But there's also the wall behind me and the painting, you know, and whatever it is. And so I tuned into this channel of Carl because I admired him from when I was a kid. I mean, he was, he was Carl Wilson, for darn sake. He played... Well, you know, I don't want to get you into the music trouble. But um, anyway, um, you know, he, he was playing the guitar. I mean, he's Carl Wilson for, you know, you know. I mean, these guys were geniuses. So, Brian, forget it. So there he is. And I'm hanging with the guy. And even though I'm hanging with, you know, it's, an, it's a delicate balance when you admire someone's talent. Sang God Only Knows. You know, he sang... Always love you, but long as there are stars above you, you'll never need to doubt it. So make you so sure about it. God only knows what I'd be without you. Anyway, I'm sitting in a room with this guy, you know, and I'm and, and he's great. He's a great guy, and that, and I, and we, we had a, we had a, you know, a, a wavelength we were on, and of course it's always difficult, you know, when you have um, well over a hundred dollars and you're hanging out with a guy who's, uh, you know, living large, and and you know, and, and deservedly so, and and so you know, but but we never had an issue with it, and we were always good friends, and uh, you know, anyway, I'm not sure what the rest of the question is, but no, uh, that was great. That was great. I've got, I've got I hope another I one here it. for you. What are your memories of performing at Woodstock with Sha Na Na in 69? Well, I'll tell you a couple of them. Well, there are many. I mean, I could I could do, um, you know, an hour on it. But, uh, I, I, well, one of the first things I remember was we left for the festival in the middle of the night, Saturday night. And you literally couldn't get up there because we were going to play Sunday. We were supposed to play in the afternoon sometime Sunday. And we, we drove and uh, you, there were a million roadblocks and we'd go, yeah, you know, we're playing the festival and you have to write. And so is my grandmother, you know, the cops went by. So then they would have to call ahead and we gave them a number call. All these people for goodness sake, and they'll tell you, well, it took us nine o'clock in the morning. We got to the Holiday Inn at Fernwood and we probably left at 10 at night. So we finally got there and uh, walked into the, we, we didn't have rooms. We were just meeting there. You know, the group was going to meet there and they were going to take us to the stage and tell us. A, I won't give you all the details, but I walked in and the first person I saw was Jimi Hendrix, who I had met and known through a mutual friend, a guy called Velvet Turner, who sat next to me in the Midwood High School mixed chorus. Now, Velvet was very close with Jimmy and he looked like Jimmy. 
and he actually did one album. If you look up Velvet Turner, he's no longer with us. But Velvet was a great guy, brilliant guy, a great artist. I mean, a painting artist. I mean, he was amazing. So I walked in and I saw Jimmy, and, and he, you know, was holding a bottle of Jack Daniels. It's nine o'clock in the morning now. You know, I, I it's nine o'clock in the morning. I've been up all night, but you know, you don't turn down arguably the greatest guitarist of the 20th century when he offers you something to drink. So. Um, we went for it and, <laughs> and did it good. And then these, well, I, uh, you know, I guess I'm in the middle of it, but a guy wanted to take me to the stage. They didn't know when they were going to put us on. Nobody knew who we were. And we had been added, I think, because Jimmy suggested it. That's a rumor is that Jimmy leaned on Mike Lang and Artie Kornfeld to put us on the show. So we were, uh, so they, they took me in a helicopter. I'd never been in one before. And we went, you know, the thing goes straight up if you're not familiar. <laughs> it's nauseating when you're drunk. So anyway, I advised um, the pilot uh, that if he continued with this business, he would probably spend the rest of his, you know, his adult life cleaning this thing. So, he, you know, because he, what he did was he tilted the chopper to show us the half million people. But the door was open and a couple of guys almost fell out. And so we came back down. This is all really. And so, you know, and, I, and so there were no other Shana Nas with me, but there were a bunch of people that going there. So I said, I, I, this is done now. Down, down, quick. So they took us down. I went back into the thing. And Jimmy saw that I, I was upset. And when I told him that the helicopter was not working for me, he laughed because he told me he was in the some number of 22nd Airborne, whatever the number was. And, you know, he, he was a paratrooper. So he thought this was funny, but he said, have a drink. It'll calm you down. So I, you know, I did. And about an hour later or whatever it was, a half an hour. So a guy came in and said, your car is here. So, you know, I wobbled out of the lobby and, and there it was. It was a 1958 Cadillac. So I get in the back seat of the car and there's a driver. And I'm thinking, hey, this is a lot better than that thing, the whirly bird. So um, we start, we're just about to pull away. And the door pops open and a guy jumps, sit, you know, pops in, slides in next to me with the orange sunglasses, the big beard and the denim jacket. And he's smiling like this. <laughs> and, you know, of course, it's Jerry Garcia. And so, you know, he's we talk and he's uh, telling me uh, about his, you know, I'm telling him about Sean and because nobody knew what it was. And, and, uh, and Jerry is too much. And he sees that I'm absolutely roaring drunk, <laughs> you know. So he offers me something to smoke. Now, just to tie it together, you know, I'm already higher than, uh, you, know, uh, you know, a kite. But, but you don't turn down arguably the biggest druggie of the 20th century when he offers you something to smoke. Now, Jerry uh, produced a little bottle and he rolled, you know, a, a very large joint and he lit it up and we passed it back and forth. <laughs> Man, and as I say in my one-man show, between um, uh, Jimmy's hooch and Jerry's hemp, I was hallucinating. <laughs> and I want to tell you, I mean, so I'm smashed. And we get to the, you know, and, and I want to tell you, we're doing about a mile an hour because you ever see those sticky things they put in the back of the cars, the little tigers, things like that? Well, they've got these, the sticky things are people, and they're all on the back and side windows going, Jerry Garcia, man. You know, it's like it was, I mean, it was unbelievable what was going on. I mean, you could not get your head around this. It was the funniest. Thing. I mean, I smashed and there's these, it was like being in the Beatles on their way to the, you know, the opening of A Hard Day's Night. I mean, Jerry Garcia was the man of the festival of, of that, of the 60s. I mean, and, and there I am. Woody Allen sitting next to him. You know, it's like in the, in one of those movies, Broadway, Danny Rose, when Woody Allen shows a picture uh, to Mia Farrow of, of Woody and Sinatra, and it's a picture of Sinatra and Woody's in the back sticking his head up. You know, that's how I felt. And it was very funny. So we go to the stage and Joe Cocker goes. So I'm like 20 feet from Joe, who I knew pretty well and did many shows with over the years. But this is the first time I saw him. And I was completely mind blown as everyone else. And I remember the blue boots with the white stars on them because I said, man, where did he find those, you know? He definitely didn't get those in Flag Brothers in Brooklyn. So, um, you know, I watched that and then the rain came. And then we just kind of, then I don't remember anything. <laughs> you know, that apparently I hung with Jerry. Do you remember being on the stage? The 
Well, that was in the morning. Yeah, because I when by the about the time that I got, you know, I I was totally cognizant when uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash and Blood, Sweat and Tears, and uh, Johnny Win Johnny Winter showed up to play with Paul and Paul Paul Butterfield showed up unannounced, and he did this, and everybody kept going on, and they kept pushing us back because, you know, and they wanted to cancel us, but Jimmy wouldn't have it. And they finally put us on at seven o'clock in the morning and I've skipped a lot of great stuff. So if you ever get a chance to see me do one hit wanderer, you should come. But um, it's not just about that, but I do a great bit. on it. So um, but uh, we do our set at seven o'clock in the morning. I slept in a, in a van on the metal grating for about 20 minutes. But I did meet Alvin Lee, who became a good friend years later after his set that he played. It was, he was fantastic. You know, Alvin was great. And as a fact, uh, about two years ago over in England, I got to spend some time, uh, you know, reminiscing with Lorraine Brejean, who was the girl that was with him. He's a very beautiful blonde girl. And Alvin had that, but they looked like twins, you know, they were meant to be. And he was just, it was wonderful. And so uh, I remember that. And then of course the great show we played and we were completely exhausted. I mean, it was, you know, just ridiculous and, and I didn't get to sing anything I, I played you know uh, so you know we did walk don't run and uh, and I was doing somersaults upside down they're actually it's actually online if you put the uh, wipeout I did was doing somersaults to wipe out. It was uh, quite embarrassing that I was the one not doing the drugs. <laughs> when, when you see that, it was it's pretty amazing. And uh, so after that, Jimmy went on and he actually used one of a couple of our amp bottoms and uh, he added to his rig. And so I was watching him and I thought, you know, because I'd seen him before, but I thought it really hit me. I knew I was going to leave Shanana at that moment because um, I, I'm thinking he's making music only he can make. You know, I'm, I want to make music only I can make. And, uh, you know, as I may have told you earlier, Shanana was a pat, well, not a parody, but a, a, a beautiful remembrance of an era of fabulous doo music and, you know, amazing voices and, and uh, that was fun. But like I told you, I, I'm not particularly excited about being an oldies version of Henry Gross either. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like to be here now, as John Lennon's fabulous button said. <laughs> okay, she's got some more questions for you. Do you still like to play the harder tunes off of the plug me into something? No. <laughs> They're none of them hard. They're all great. You know, there's there's that. There was that one. There was. And I love her. Yes, I love her. Uh -huh. There's one more tomorrow. There was this. There was oh. Well, I don't wanna shock you, but I I got a plan. Find me smoking Yankees. Make a seven. You know, I, yeah, I could do them all. <laughs> Only, in fact, I just played in Memphis, which is my probably my favorite place to play on planet Earth. I have a love affair with the city of Memphis since 1971 or so. And I've been playing um, two wonderful places, Blue City Cafe. But lately, the last few years, I've been playing at uh, Lafayette's Music Room, where I played in the same spot, the original Lafayette's from in the early 70s. And it's just a fabulous room with a fabulous sound system and Tommy and Liz Peters that run it. I mean, it's great. And right now they're closed down and I'll, you know, I'll do whatever number of they need or whatever to bring them back any help when this thing passes. But Memphis is just great. And then so I played the whole, whole album cover to cover. Oh, cool. and, and the reason I do it when I go to Memphis, because oh, cool. it was oh, they were, all my early records were had a lot of hits in Memphis. That, and I say hits, they were very, they, every album track was well known. So after one show, I did this two hour show and I, it was, people loved it. And this guy came up to me, he said, man, I'm never coming back to see you. You only played two songs or three songs and plugged me into something. And I thought, he's right. You know, I mean, they, he wants to hear him. And I, if I'd known, if he'd yelled him out, 
but he was polite, I'd have done him. Well, I never got that wrong again. And if you're listening, whoever you are, uh, if you show up again, I'll do them. <laughs> you know? She's got some more for you. This is great. Who knew Henry was so funny? Did you ever try doing comedy? I did. And, and I was working. I, I, I was in a band when I was 14. I only did one 10 minute segment and thought, I'm going to leave this to the greater co comedians, to the guys that want to do it. Because I had a musical ability and I could sing. You remember what I told you about Brother Al? We should do that. <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, so um, remind me of the question because I just moved to the other thing when I said it. Um, oh, yeah, the comedian. The All comedian. right. So I love comedy. I grew up. I mean, the Marx Brothers. Groucho was my idol. You know, uh, is your husband dead? Did he leave you any money? Answer the second question first. You know, it, uh, it was incredible. She says, I held him in my arms and I kissed him, Margaret Dumont. He says, so it was murder. You know, it's incredible. The man's, and W.C. Fields, I mean, was I in here last night and did I spend a $20 bill in the bank? They can, Shemp Howard is the bartender, says, yeah. And he goes, oh, thank goodness. I thought I lost it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great stuff. So I grew up on this, you know, this magnificent humor that you did not have to have a knowledge of sitcoms to appreciate. But where did you, you know, get that? Where did you get that? Was that in your family? Was that an uncle? Did you just... My dad was a lunatic. My dad used to take me to the cemetery to visit. To visit. He had a very dark sense of humor, a uh, very macabre sense of humor. He would take me to the cemetery to visit his father's grave. And I'm walking across the cemetery. We would always walk by these beautiful, you know, the limestone mausoleum buildings. My father would never fail to point to those buildings and say, those guys really know how to live. You know, where, where are you going to go? When that's, you, I mean, a lot of my songs came from things my dad said. My dad always used to tell me when I was struggling with something, the impossible takes a little bit longer. And that became a song on One Hit Wanderer. He said, and I promise you, this is where Al Bonetta got this, John Prine's manager that got this and, and put it all over the world. Um, it's not the money. It's the money. My dad said that all the time. And I told it to Al Bonetta. And I, and, I, and I said, Al, don't be taking my title. And he said, no, no, no. And then he made Al, he made Bonetta bucks that said, it's not the money. It's the money. <laughs> I love Al. God bless. Anyway, people know it. And they left. But he said a lot of very funny things. I mean, funny, dark, funny, clever things. Yeah. So yeah, so uh, um, but the comedy. So I'm, so I, I'm going to uh, a guy says I'm in a band and I'm playing this little hotel called the Esther Manor, which is next to Monticello Raceway in the Catskills. And I'm always telling jokes. So the guy who who was a guy called Mambo Bob, who was, um, you know, a hotel gigolo. Anyway, so he says to me, he says, you with the big mouth. He said, I'm being I'm editing what he really said. He said, you with the big mouth. You want to see how this is done? He says, Come see Billy Eckstein's show tonight. So he invites me to his show. Billy Eckstein is the, you know, great jazz singer, and he's on going to be the headliner. And I'm at some other hotel. Someone drove myself and a couple of guys over there from the band. And I'm, you know, it's, there's no, it's a kitchen, and I'm telling jokes, you know. And this guy says, "You with the big um, F dash mouth." He says, "You with the big mouth. You think it's so funny? Go out there, and be funny for ten minutes." So I, I went out there, and I'm telling every joke. I could tell and didn't even know I was on. They were too busy shoveling food in their mouth. You remember, the only thing that comes to mind is Magical Mystery Tour when Lennon has the pitchfork and the spaghetti. I mean, they're, they're, this, is the, it, this is the kind of hunger that's going on there. And, and I'm dying. I'm telling, I'm trying to tell them jokes, you know, and they don't even know I'm on. And this little woman looks up to me and she says, it's all right. You're a nice boy. You don't have to be funny for us. <laughs> I was 14 years old. I was impotent for a month. <laughs> I mean, give me a break. It was murder. I'm with the Catskills, but that's another movie. I have to devote an entire day to it. Okay, hold on. We're going to get some more questions. Yeah, you can I've see. Quite you, a few more questions here. John, John Henry's all gray and he's bald. What's left of it? He's got a big bald in the front. And then they says, is Henry Gross still talking? You know, because... Most of my friends, they text now because when they call, they look, they go, do I have three hours? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why, why can't we get My Sunshine on CD? Are you talking about My Sunshine from my ABC Dunhill album? 
I have a, I have the one I saw that went sunshine. You look that one. Just wow, I can't believe you're aware of that. CD. Oh, so he didn't that, know. That Maybe he on didn't ABC, know. Dunhill Records, ABC Records, actually. Uh, let me see if I remember. It was ABC X 747 was the serial number. That's funny. Uh, that song, uh, I got signed by a guy called Howard Gilman, who was an A&R guy at, at ABC. And he signed me. Uh, I went to his office with my uh, lawyer, who was Robert Wax, who discovered Eddie Murphy. And Robert Wax and, and, and Arsenio Hall, Eddie Griffin. You know, uh, he was just an amazing person, Robert Wax. He's no longer with us. And uh, he brought me to, he, he got me a, an A&R audition for this guy, Howie Gelman, who is today one of my good friends still. And Howie listened to all these songs I had, but I had a lot. And he said, look, man, you got one hit song there, which was My Sunshine. And he said, but you got a lot of great jokes. I'm going to sign you. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the jokes worked in the music side worked for me, you know, and, you know, then, of course, then, you know, you and, and I'm glad I'm not a real comedian because I'm a, I could be happy if you ever if you want to be miserable. You hang around with comics, you know, it's it, it's tough it's you know, because, goes, yeah. gotta be for a living. You know, it's a tough job. People think, oh, aren't you funny all the time? No, it's 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 hard to be Rodney Dangerfield or Jack Benny, you know, or any of these guys. Milton Berle. Yeah. I, speaking of Milton. He's on Larry King one night. I'm going to give you this because I have to. He's on Larry King, Milton Berle, and he's 92 years old. And every time Milton gets to a punchline, Larry King talks and steps on Milton's punchline. Now, Milton's taken this. Now, this is Milton Berle. You know, this is a guy who knows every joke. He's stolen most. And he admitted it. You know, he even said, I saw a comedian so funny last night, I dropped my pencil. So, you know, <laughs> this is a funny man. <laughs> so this is a funny man. So Larry keeps stepping on the punchlines. Finally, Milton, I'll never forget it. I got to get a tape of this. It's, I can't find it on YouTube. And he says, uh, you know, Larry, where we live, we don't get your show. He says, uh, we see it, but we don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm not a comic, because that's funny. <laughs> yeah. You know, a guy was heckling Milton Berle once. And, that, and, and, and Milton said to me, he says, wait a minute. I know you. You were at a show... Uh, you were at a show of mine 50 years ago. I never forget a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got to get to another question. We got to get to another okay, question. Okay, two questions. You started it. You how started having, asking for comedy. How did having a big uh, hit song like Shannon change your life? Well, I became phenomenally e egotistical and would not even talk to myself. <laughs> I was too good for myself. That's how deep I took it. I mean, I would not, I would dial myself and not answer. You know, like Joe Walsh said, maybe I'll, maybe, you know, just leave a message. Maybe I'll call. I didn't even dream anymore. No, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. It was especially as a person that loved animals my whole life and, and loves to do things for humane society, whatever, whenever I can, you know, and, and has always had a house full of, uh, right now we have three little dogs and, and a cat. And we've had as many as six dogs and four cats at once. My wife is going to skateboard into heaven. They're going to bring me these animals. You know, you say, what would you do last night? You mean from like 3.30 to 4.30? I clean poop. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, that's what I did. Oh, you slept. Good for you. <laughs> you know, so we, it's a full-time job. Okay. Uh, and the question was uh, something uh, uh, oh about, it. but it was great because I got to work, seriously, I got to work with everybody that I ever heard of. You know, I got to play shows with every act. I mean, I worked, I did many, many shows with the Beach Boys, many with the Doobie Brothers, many, with, I worked with Billy Joel. I'd be, I was on a show with Bruce Springsteen. I was on a show, you, you name it. I mean, I can't go, I worked with Roger McGuinn. I mean, I, I you know, I got to know Roger a little. And these are wonderful people, very talented people. And I'm very, very lucky, which is why I always sang, you know, One Hit Wanderer. The waitress asked me if I'm famous. I say no, but I'm hungry. She says the eggs are cold, the toast is burnt, the bacon's mostly fat, and I say, Lucky me, I like it like that. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> lucky me, I like that. You know what I'm saying? I like it. Uh, lucky me. That's how I look at my life. You know, I don't, um, there's a line in that song. 
that says it goes uh, the bridge. Because every day I play it straight, never tempt the hand of fate. In a world of give and take, I take what's given. So people ask me, do you wish things had been? No, I'm here. What if, you know, a lot of people had a million hits and got run over by themselves or, or airplanes? I mean, I, I'm the luckiest guy, on, you know, in the Western world. I mean, I, life is good. And every day that we share things like this, I meet you guys and do it's how happy you want to be. I mean, you want to just <laughs> you start talking to yourself in the street. <laughs> it's, well, it's great. And, you know, the, the thing that you and I have talked about this a few times that uh, I find it rare for to, to interview someone, to talk to someone, to hear an album where I'm going, holy crap, man, he's on top of his game. You know, you, you, to me, the, your new album is is what, like I said, it's one of the best albums I've heard in the last five years. And and I, thank you. What can I say? You know, I mean, that was the idea was to do something better than I've ever done because, you know, it's, it's just funny how things have worked out. None of us know if we're ever going to get to play live again. Yeah. You know, they're talking about, I mean, it's funny because I spoke to, you know, I, I always have this thing I like to say, you know, I, one thing I hate in show business is a name dropper. And so I was talking to Felix Cavalieri this afternoon and, and he was telling me, you know, they're going to try and do two shows a night, a uh, two 60 minute shows instead of one big show. So people can sit far apart. You know, but my career was never that huge. So, you know, when I very, you know, it would happen to me sometimes that I'd be in a, a 200, 200 seat theater and there'd be 50 people. And I would say to him, gee, uh, I didn't know that uh, Cleveland, Tennessee was such a wealthy town uh, because I see each of you bought 50 seats. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, in a world of give and take, I take what's given. And, and that will you know, and, and you just keep working hard and you sing, you know, I sing, uh, remember the, I, t I relate things to movies because my mom loved, she was a real movie buff and so I became one. And uh, at least until they went to color and then I lost interest. But um, you, you remember like in the Chariots of Fire when the guy, he runs for the God's pleasure. Yeah. And I sing for my mom's pleasure, you know, she's gone and I sing for her pleasure and she loved the music. So what am I going to do? Henry, you got to share that story of your mom walking by and you were, you told me that t this afternoon. Yeah. We were well, that's how I really got, I knew, you know, I was very fortunate that I kind of knew what I always wanted to do from a young age and because in New York, and we were talking about this, uh, you, you know, uh, you, you could get on like on a clear night, you could get stations from far away. I mean, we had two big rock stations, WMCA and WABC, which was the biggest thing in the world. But we could get WKBW from Buffalo on a Sunday night. I mean, no problem. We got it clear as a bell. And uh, like I told you, that's where I learned Hey Joe by the Leaves before anybody else had it. I mean, people thought we wrote it and I, I didn't correct them, you know. <laughs> you know, they said, hey, Jimi Hendrix is doing your song. <laughs> it was great. But anyway, uh, but um you know, a thing worth having is worth cheating for WC Fields. So, uh, you know, my, but, but I, I, there was a station that came in from Haywood, California. Now, I had no idea where this was. I found out last year or the year before last, I played a show it was in this uh, town right near Berkeley, right outside of Berkeley. And and I saw a sign, Haywood, California, like three miles. I mean, and I thought, oh, wow. Well, there was a, a, a faith healer, preacher named Brother Al, and you can look this up, it's hard to believe, but Brother Al had a great act. And, 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 and Brother Al's uh, act was that he would, well, he would play the great gospel music. So I got, I just loved how he rapped. You know, he was like a rapper, but I didn't know what a rapper was, no one did. But he would, he was just great. I mean, he would rap on and it was just mesmerizing how he would talk about things religious and things you know, uh, secular, and he was just, but he had the rhythm and had the groove, I and mean, he was fantastic. And then he would play Mahalia Jackson and James Cleveland and talk about, you know, the, the great Thomas Dorsey, who wrote all these incredible songs down by the riverside and all this. And so you got an education in gospel music. Now, where was I going to get that? So, you know, it was, it was it, you know, it was fantastic. So all this music, I mean, you remember when we were kids, and I'll include you because I'm older than you, you know, a decade, but still, on the radio, you could hear Slim Harpo and Dinah Shore. I mean, it was the 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 music that was available to us 
was a melange of brilliant stuff from all over the place. It was fantastic, you know. You could hear, you know, just amazing music. So uh, I'm listening to this music, and 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 and, and he had the act of all time. He he would uh, heal people uh, of disease of, of like uh, uh, crippling diseases over the radio. So <laughs> if you would, but he would say, "Send me five dollars, and I will pray for you." And I'll and he would heal people, and they would go, "Brother Al, I'm, I can walk." I can see again over the radio. <laughs> it was, and I thought this is a great job. I could, you know, I wished I could have. I thought there's a future there, you know. <laughs> I mean, Sam Kinison did that for a while, and then he quit. But I mean, you know, it's it's a great act. I mean, whether you know, although um, there is some truth, there is a lot of truth to uh, you know healing yourself spiritually. So all these things. Are mixed messages, you know. It's so easy to be cynical about those things, but the, you know, the, but when somebody comes over and puts his hands on your shoulder and heals it, um, which happened to me, uh, then all of a sudden, you know, and I'm the most. Is there anyone you ever meet more cynical? No. But this guy, he'll healed me by holding my shoulder, and he said, "I healed myself." And I went, "Yeah." Then why am I paying you twenty five bucks? But any, but anyway, you know. <laughs> your mom. Anyway, your mom. Your mom. But what was the question? So, mom. so mom walked in and I was singing along with these. See, I get it. My wife's going to say, answer his question for God's sake. But he uh, she walked by my room and I was singing along with some of these songs. And, you know, and the, and the great gospel singers do the thing that you hear now commonly from great singers like Beyonce. It's called stair stepping. Little Richard brought it to the public when he would go, ready, set, go, cat, go. I got a girl I love so and I'm ready. Here we go. Ready, ready, Teddy, I'm ready. And you step, eh, 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 hit every note on the scale going down. Well, I was doing it to some gospel singer. I was doubling him. I had learned this song and I was singing along. My mom went by and she had sung briefly in a Metropolitan Opera Chorus. And she heard me do this and flipped out. She thought, uh oh, he's going to be a singer, <laughs> you know. And so I, it made her so happy. What was I going to do? Go to medical school for my father? <laughs> your mom always outranks your father. You know, jokes are no jokes. <laughs> so I get to some more I, questions. Okay, I've got one here. For the memory of my brother who was a guitar player and instilled my love of music, could you play a little bit of Sam the Sham, Little Red Riding Hood for me, please? I knew Sam the Sham. Uh, hey there, little red riding hood. I turned down a peanut. I don't remember the word. <laughs> hey, little red riding hood. I knew that. Uh, how about, you know, unos, dos, one, two, tres, cuatro. <laughs> enough Yay. <laughs> but that had one of the great lines i ever heard in a song he says let's don't be don't be l7 l7 come and learn to dance right do you ever hear that don't be l7 come and learn to dance l7 it's a square an l and a seven makes a square so he was saying don't be square How clever. poetry to rock and roll my brother and sister <laughs> Rock and roll was not, you know, it, you didn't have to go as deep as Bob Dylan, you know, to get to amazing poetry. I mean, you know, that, these the rock and roll that we grew up on was full of these incredibly witty things. Don't be L7. Come and learn to dance. Man, you don't want to do that for a living? I learned something today. You're there you go. <laughs> I'm just learning stuff. We got to get some questions. Somebody okay. want to ask you some questions. Keep Henry, going. Henry, thank you so much for your time and sharing your biggest regret working in the recording industry. There's no regrets. You know, I had when I was young and I was crazy to become 
uh, you know, to, to get over and make a living. You know, it was really about making a living. I was, you know, trying to make a living in music. So I had all this pressure on me, you know, to try and succeed, to pay the bills, you know, and, and do all this. And, and so, you know, my original producers and I would go at it head to head and we're all good friends today. You know, we all got over it and, and we all love each other. You know, we did something tremendously terrific together. But when you're young, you know, you find things to, there's a great line that someone said to me, and I can't remember who it was in Nash. Oh yeah, it was a guy called Vince Malamud. He's a great songwriter. And I, and I was complaining about something and he said, oh, you find bone in egg. <laughs> you know, which is a great line, which is, you know, you, you'll find something. I'll give you a Cadillac and you'll tell me it's the wrong color. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like you can live your life that way where you can just get over it. And by getting over it, really getting over it. I mean, OK, you get pangs of I wish this had happened or that had happened. I wish I'd done things. Do I have regrets? Yeah. You know, my first wife died at 43. Do I wish that I had taken her to an island? She went, Yeah. Do I did things, you know, I wish I'd done some other things. Yeah. But as far as music, I did the best I could do. Do I wish that plugged me into something that was got the knockdown drag out push other albums got in that release for whatever reason? Sure, man, because it's still people love it all over the world. So somebody blew it and it wasn't me, you know. <laughs> so, you know, but it, what can I say? Does it, it when it all washes out, we're here today and I wouldn't trade this. I wouldn't trade the, the, the wonderful feeling I got when you liked all the songs in this album that I couldn't have worked harder on one word or one note. And I work with a guy called John McLean, I told you. And John, I mean, meeting him changed my life because I met a guy who had a, who's not only a great recording engineer, but a great bass player, a great drummer, a genius level guitar player, a brilliant pianist. He plays, I mean, it's a joke. He plays um, trombone. He plays saxophone as good as anyone alive. I mean, listen to Santiago, Ro Santiago Rose. That's one take. Yeah. It's yeah. one take because he understands. I said to John, I'm, I'm giving him a little bit here because John McClain, I'm, I'm, you know, we've cut every kind of song. We did The Ghost of Myself, which is kitschy Halloween. We've done, you know, you name it. We've do, I did a song called Happy New Year to almost everyone. And and I said to Jim, and it's it's a it's a great little tune. It's a wonderful little song. And you you look it up, you'll hear it. And uh and, and John said to me, well, how do you hear this? And I said, don't take I said, I hear this as James Taylor playing with uh Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians. Now not a lot of guys, not a lot of folks, young, young folks don't know, but the great thing about the Royal Canadians was they had a sax player who put a lot of vibrato. So it was like, you know, it's like that. Well, John says, oh, OK. And he knew it and he played it. And I went, Geez, you know, come on. Can I stump the band? I said, I want to cut this. He's, he says, well, how do you? I said, I got a polka I want to cut. I had a polka that I was going to do and that I wrote with Roger Cook. And he says, oh, I played in a polka band in Erie, Pennsylvania for five years. And I'm going. Come on. All right. Great. Let's do some plasma music. Did you play in Tel Aviv, too? I mean, come on. <laughs> he would be the only Irishman that played in Tel Aviv. I mean, the guys. So meeting him. And, you know, it's great when you have a lot. People always say, you know, it's great. To, and, and I agree with this to a large degree. When you have five musicians on a session. Well, if you're 50 years old, then you've got 250 years worth of experience instead of 50. Right. Because you've got all these people. But John and I having mutual experience and we've done so many songs together that he kind of knows where I want to go. Yeah. And he also knows when I'm going so far out that we're never going to be able to wrestle it back in. There was, there was one song I made John cut. And I don't know if he's going to hear this, if he's hearing this, but we did a song and I had the idea that this was clever. It was called bail is out of jail. It was B E L a apostrophe S out of jail. Now, this was one of the only songs that my wife threatened me if I spent our money on <laughs> that she might pull the future budgets. And she didn't like it and Jim didn't like it much. And not only that, the the uh, the recording equipment didn't like it either because it all failed in the middle of it. <laughs> so, but generally speaking, um, we have made some pretty wild records, some very creative records, and I'm very proud of them. And John is an amazing person and. Uh, Lucky me. 
Let what me, can let I me say? Give you, let me give a plug for the album. A, a too clever for my own good. Uh, Henry and I just did a video where we talk about every single track on the album. We play snippets of every track, and the link to that, as well as Henry's website, where you can pick up the album, is right in the description of this video we're watching right now. Shannon's going to give you another. And if I can say, actually, have okay, a but just I have a just comment. let me say this. Because I got all the time in the world, whatever you want to do. But but I just want to say that watching that video when you you gave it to me last night to look at, I thought, and I mean this because I don't, you know, look at my interview. I mean, you you edited it. It felt like the album. I mean, it felt as like a record. It was so well edited. I was so happy to be on your. And I hope if any musicians are listening, that you get in touch with John and uh, somehow talk him into it because you'll Thanks. you'll come out much better than you really are. <laughs> oh, you didn't need any help. Got smoke and mirrors going over there, and it's very good. Uh, ask okay. If, yeah, I've got a couple comments. By here. the way, before you say that, mm. I'm on my phone because I have to text my son upstairs to bring my cord for my i for my for my computer, which is running out of power. So I'm not being disrespectful. I just got to get a hold nope, of it. I sat with Cowboy Jack Clement once in his studio, and he had a little speaker on, and he would get on this talkback, and he would yell upstairs to uh, add more bass. And Johnny Cash was upstairs recording, and Cowboy was producing me, sitting and talking to me and Steve Singleton, and he, and telling him what to do in the studio. So I'm not put off by anybody uh, well, doing anything well, else. We don't want to go that. offline because we, we literally <laughs> lose our power. <laughs> okay, so oh. I've, got, I've got a comment here for you, if I may. My 95-year-old father was just diagnosed with COVID-19. I'm devastated. Henry, you lifted my spirits and given me some life lessons tonight, oh. and thank you. Well, God bless you. God bless you, Father. I mean, look, this is a, a very, very difficult thing that whatever this whatever this thing is, um, it, it seems to be really hurting older folks or folks with health issues. I mean, look, I mean, I was very, very had a great love for John Prine and he was a friend and I, I knew him very well. And, you know, and uh, it's just this is a you know this is just a you know the world's nightmare. I was going to say America's nightmare, but that's ridiculous. You know it's the world's nightmare, and uh, this is a horrible thing. But there's always a chance your dad will pull through, and so there's no guarantees. And if we knew, uh, we would be God Almighty, but we don't. So we we'll pray for you, Dad, and uh, you will, and you'll be wonderful, and and uh, you know. Um, the best way, and, and, and I'm not making light of it because a lot of, but the best way to, to ensure is it, it book them a gig because no one ever dies when they're booked. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a rule of life. If you, you just book him a show in a local pub and, and, and man, he'll get there. Even if he doesn't do music, if he gets to tell his stories, he'll show up for it and he'll, he'll be good for at least another you know couple of years till we have live gigs again. So I love you and uh, take care. Do you, okay, okay. do you have any plans for recording any new music just for yourself and the fans? I just cut 17 songs. And, you know, and it's funny because the the wisdom you get from some of the proverbial wise men of our business is you know, just cut one track. That's all people care. They don't have time to listen to your stuff. And, and you know, I've, I've probably said this to you before and I don't mean to repeat myself, but I don't believe that. I think if all you've got is one song, yeah, put out that song if you think it's the right one. But for me, I write a lot, and I'm an, an observer, and I and I and writing songs is fun for me. That's what I do. It's my golf. You know, I don't. I tested negative for golf and positive for songwriting. So that to me, like I say, I've been I've been self quarantining for 50 years. I sit and write these songs. So it's people say, "How you doing?" I go, "How am I doing?" Well, I only wrote three songs. You know, it's not so good, but. That's that's the the, the point. Uh, so I'm, I'm not remind me of the question because I got off on on that. Um, it was just about recording uh, any new music. Oh no, yeah. So so I wrote a lot of songs. So my my thing is that you know for people that don't care about what I do or don't share the vision that I have of music, a one song of mine is too much. They're not interested. If you like, and I mean, if if you like rap and rap is great, you know. I mean, I bought Grandmaster Flash is the message. I bought the first one. So it's not that. But if you like that, well, then you're not going to like a Henry Gross record. But if you like almost any kind of pop music that's been on between 50 and 1980 or 1990, you're going to like a lot of what I do. And so 17 songs is not enough for the people that like me. And the reason I love the CDs is because the sequencing and the way you put together a record is every bit as important as the, the way you build the song itself. 
and the way you build the arrangement. It's it's the sequencing is is the third the third rail of this whole thing, and and it's a it's a sin that that they're trying to eliminate that, or they are eliminating that in the semifinals, and, you know, along with so many other things uh, we love like driving your car. But I've already written that song, and we talked about that. Speaking of that, right. let me interrupt you. Speaking of that, I, I want to answer the, for the first person who just asked you that. Uh, in the description of this video, there's a track by track uh, feature that that Henry and I did on uh, Too Clever for My Own Good, the brand new album. Amazing album, not a bad track off it. And also a link where you can pick it up on Henry's website. So for the person who just asked that. There you go. And you can you can download it anywhere where records are downloaded, where songs are downloaded or albums are downloaded. And man, I made it cheap, cheap. I mean, there's 17 songs. I mean, the downloads, I think $9.99 everywhere, you know, that CD Baby or iTunes or wherever you go for that. And the records are, you know, it, this thing, what do you, the cover, everything about it. I did the best possible job. The people, in fact, I, I got a call from, uh, uh, you know, uh, both guys that worked on the album cover tonight. And, uh, you know, they're, they're just amazing people. And they worked so hard on the cover. And uh, Steve Satterwhite, you know, and uh, it, it just did a phenomenal job. And, and it was just... Uh, uh, what can I say? You know, um, I mean, I'm, uh, let me look here and, uh, because I'm doing my, I'm having a brain of uh, David Spagnolo. I only spoke to him for an album tonight, uh, for an hour tonight. He and Steve Satterwhite, Steve's done all my, almost all of my covers on, on Zelda records. And the first two we weren't doing, but then we got into it and, you know, we, Steve and I, we get, it's, it's like, it's like UFC fighting. We get in there and we literally kill each other and come out with a great cover all the time. <laughs> it, it's brutal. Most people can't stand to be around it. They're not tough enough. But we do it. And we do it. And the fur flies. I mean, huge chunks of fur fly off our backs. Fur flies. But we, we, we get it. And when we do all this, and, you know, and the, the record's like 15 bucks for 17 songs. I will never make the money back. I don't care. I don't have, you know, I, I, my life's work. I'm, I'm doing this for you whoever you are that's listening and it'll all go to the animals anyway. So, you know, buy a Henry gross record, save a dog, a cat, a horse, whatever they save with the money. Okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Uh, you've got some more. I've got, um, what, what was your most memorable moment at Woodstock? I know you probably have several, but do you have one moment that just stands out more than. Yeah, I think it was, all right. I think it's an easy one for me. I think really, it, it is um, it's it's the epiphany of realizing that um, I got to go make my own music watching Jimi Hendrix at that moment. I mean, I was going to say meeting Alvin Lee because he became a, a good friend, but which, you know, was great. But really that moment for my own life of, of realizing that, you know, you can it was would have been the easiest thing in the world to stay with Sean and I. I mean, it was a it was a sure thing in a business of. No thanks, you know. What are the odds of, of getting? And I just thought, you know, um, you know, because I'm not known to be a gambler. I'm not a guy. I never buy a stock. I don't put money in a stock. I don't gamble. When people tell me, oh, you buy six of these, you'll get 300 of them by Tuesday. I don't care. I don't want them. If I have six, I'm happy with six. I mean, to the chagrin of my wife, I can tell you that. But um, you know, I don't care. I never made the decisions based on money. I made them on survival and making the music, and I continue to do that. I mean, people say to me, you've got two houses. Yeah, but both my houses cost less than your apartment. You know, so, I mean, you know, it's like, I don't care. I, my money's in guitars, and, you know, I got six amplifiers, and one of them goes on every record I make. <laughs> so, by the way, almost, uh, by the way you, 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 we were talking this afternoon, you got to know Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, I, I met him. Uh, before uh, he was a big shot uh, through Velvet Turner. Uh, I was coming out of uh, the Waverly Theater in Manhattan and walked right into Velvet and Jimmy. And uh, they invited me and uh, the person I was with over to uh, some apartment on Bleecker Street. He was noodling on a guitar and we were all sitting around. And uh, this was about, I suppose, this was about 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And I was able, you know, to to go home at around eight or nine in the morning. And so we had a very pleasant evening and I got to know him. So when Sean and I played the Steve Paul scene for the first time, 
Jimmy had heard about it and came down and I looked at him when we laughed at each other, you know, and it was great. So he would come down and, you know, jam with us afterwards. And, uh, and that's a funny story too, but, uh, because it was a, there was a choice there. Yeah. We were in this little dressing room, he and I, and he walked in and all he had was his guitar. He brought a, you know, he brought a Strat in a case and I was in this dressing room with him. And here was the choice because do I ask him the question? In, in Nashville, there's a word, it's a Nashville word, and it's a wonderful word, it's called germ. To germ is to basically prosti prostitute yourself in front of a greater celebrity and, and become disgusting and, and, you know, fawning and all the nauseating stuff that, you know, everyone in show business does to everyone else who's a little higher rung. And it's, in Nashville, they call it germing. But there was a question that I wanted to know so bad I wanted to know, and it's the nerdiest question, and it is the nerd question of all time. And and I and, and it and I said to myself, do I ask him? Because if you ask a question like this of a, of a great guitar player, on the one hand he might be happy to tell you, on the other hand, are you really going to be friends anymore, or now are you just another fan that he's got to get out of the room politely with? So the question was. I asked my guitar player friends, what's the most, imb I said, hey, Jimmy, I did it because I didn't care. I had to know. I said, what kind of guitar strings do you use? <laughs> and I did it. And he was great. And he opened his case and he took it out. He took out all the strings he had in his case that were loose. And they were all, for those of you who remember Dan Armstrong's music on LaGuardia Place in the West Village. They were Dan Armstrong super strings, eights on top. There's your answer, folks. There's the answer machine, the answer grape, giving you the answer. They were Dan Armstrong super string eights. Do you still have them, Henry? Yes, I do. Do you think they're worth a fortune? I don't think they're worth a plug nickel because I wasn't disgusting enough, and I'm, I will say it crossed my mind to ask him the even worse question, would you sign the package? But even I wasn't low enough to do that. <laughs> so I didn't. And I've got them. And everybody that knows me knows they're real because I showed them to him at the time. But, you know, they're Jimmy Strings right out of his case. Wow. That's amazing. That's a nerdy story, isn't that's it? A I mean, that's story. a great story. That's a great story. But I'm happy to be Jimi Hendrix's nerd story because to any story with that guy is with, you know, you know, I mean, really, I mean, I, I'll be his nerd and I'll be Muddy Waters roadie. You know, I don't care. You know, like, but I've talked to a, a few people who knew him they, and they would say he was actually a soft spoken kind of guy. Like, what was he like? He was great. He was a regular guy. He was a, at least the times I spent with him, he wasn't he was very, I mean, extremely smart, extremely bright. He was not, you know, uh, any kind of crazy at all you know i mean any with being stoned or that thing no it's just like kids are doing i mean he was absolutely great i mean the time it, and, and you know he, he the woodstock thing you know i spent that time with him there and it, you know, he was spent a lot of jokes you know i mean if he told him a joke he laughed he's not one of these guys that was too cool to laugh at a funny joke because hey uh, i'm cool you know I, I got sunglasses on i don't laugh at jokes you know it's like he laughed a wholehearted laugh you know he's a good guy Okay. And I could wear anyone out. <laughs> Is there anyone in the music business you would like to work with? Well, I'd like to work with John McClain again. <laughs> I love working with anybody. I, I mean, there's so many people, you know, and we didn't, John and I, I have a friend who I'll give some props. His name is Lee Brovitz. He was in the original Blue Angel with Cindy Lauper. He plays with, I mean, a million different acts. He plays with Tommy Rowe and all, a lot of years. He, he's played with, I mean, just, I can't, you know, just so many people. He played with me. I mean, there's a lot of different Lee, he's like my consigliere on my records. You know, uh, he's my uh, consigliere. Like I, I'll say, Lee, what do you think? They'll go, ah, oh, it's got to be a couple of beats a minute faster. Or he'll say, that's a good arrangement. I really like it, but forget about it and do it this way. <laughs> you know? And, <laughs> well, yeah, you know, listen, uh, there, there was a, a, and Lee is great. He's really, and, he, and he's, he makes these great blues albums. Uh, Gemma Pearl uh, that he writes the songs for and produces and they're terrific and she's a great singer I think she's out somewhere in Montana or Wyoming someplace God knows where but Lee is uh, in uh, Marco Island and he's great bass player I mean really really great 
And so he's very helpful. And I used to have the greatest consigliere in the world for 35 years. It was a guy called Mike Chapman. Mike Chapman is one of the best bass players that ever lived. I mean, a real, ta- he was Muscle Shoals' second call. He played a bass on almost every Garth Brooks record. And um, the night of Mike's funeral, and, and so anyway, I never, every time I'd finish a song, Mike, once a week or so, or two weeks, would come over, and I'd play him my new songs, and, and he had a great Alabama drawl, which he cultivated. And he'd say, because I did about 100 shows with Mike over the 35 years or whatever we were friends, and just he and I as a duo, you know, we'd go out and play a trio with Chucky Burke on drums, this blues, blues drummer. And, and so he'd say, uh, you know, Henry, say, uh, you know, we've got some other songs. We've got, meaning we'll do it. Just, we've got some other songs that are uh, kind of like that, but I believe they might be a bit better. And I would write in front of him, take the lyric sheet and tear it up. And you, you couldn't find the pieces if you went looking for them. <laughs> so to tell you how great, I'll give Mike some. Tell you how great Mike Chapman was. I sang Lucky Me at his funeral, and I did not know, I've never met Garth Brooks, and I did not know that Garth and Tricia came, were in the room when I sang it. I had no idea. And, uh, you know, of course, everyone would love to meet Garth. He's a genius level entertainer, and Tricia is such a great singer. But I didn't know there was, so I sang the song, and, you know, it, it was difficult to get through it for me, but. That night, Garth had a concert somewhere, all the way up in Canada somewhere. And so I guess he took his private plane, went up there, you know, and, and he uh, goes online on Facebook, be- talks to his fans from the dressing room before he goes on. And he said something about Mike Chapman that I don't know if I can tell it now without crying. I'll pinch myself. But he said uh, that he was going to record some songs without the bass. So I can't do it. See, I can't get through it. Chris Lusinger, if you're watching, you'll get it. Or, or you know, uh, he said because he wanted everyone to know what it was like to miss Mike. Wow. Wow. That's powerful. That's powerful. So, you know, if people want to say anything about Garth Brooks, <laughs> they're going to have to go through me. <laughs> you know, this is a good guy. That's why God made him who he is. Yeah. This guy is doing a lot right. To think that way for a guy who could be the biggest horse's ass that ever lived. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's the Beatles. Yeah. Guy sells a billion yeah. records. He doesn't have to see. see. This, this is the wonder of the music that as much as you walk into people, and then I won't name names, although I could go down a list, man, we'd be it next week of people I wish I'd never met because now I can't hear their songs. And then you meet somebody and, you know, you know, you know, and then you then that happens. So what the hell do you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. he, he, life will always surprise you. So don't be too sure of who you think's a nice guy and who you think's not. I mean, I'm not that I didn't think he was because I knew how good he was to Mike and to, uh, you know, to Mike's family, but and to all the guys in this group and all the people that still play with him. So there you go. Yeah. There's my Garth Brooks bit. But the point was that Mike was a genius and helped me with my songs. And he helped Garth Brooks with his music. And he helped, when Mike passed away, 85 bass players in Nashville. And I want to tell you, number 85 bass player in Nashville is number one with a bullet in any town in America. You know, except maybe L.A. and New York where it's a toss-up. But, or Miami. But, you know, they all wanted to play on this thing. I mean, I got to sing a song of... You know, we played Garth Brooks songs that Mike played on, and the bass players played exactly his parts. It was a tribute to raise money for one of the you know, musician funds. And so the room was packed to the gills. And, you know, what a statement of a guy's life. Yeah. I mean, I met 100 people there that night that said, if not for this guy, I would. <laughs> what, what, how's your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be? Yeah. You know. Okay, let's get to yeah. a few more questions for you. When things get back to normal, are you going to tour again? Ha <laughs> ha. Well, you know, I'm not exactly a household name. You know, it's funny because I was I was with a my great friend Jonathan Edwards today, and Jonathan is a lucky guy because he had a hit "Sunshine," which I love to do. Sunshine, go away today, because that's how John sounds, you know. And I love the record. I love John, and uh, but he had a lot of big fans between like 
Maine and, and D.C. And, and they like him everywhere, but they really loved him there. So a lot of his records were sold there. I sold one record in every zip code in the world. So wherever I go, one table of people shows up. <laughs> you know, And it's hard for me to draw a big crowd. So you know, that's why it's, I hope people enjoy this. I hope they enjoy this record. This is, I've never had more of the pieces of the universe come together for me than this record even though it's the most unlikeliest of times in my life, the most unlikeliest of times in, in the world, and certainly in the music business, because, I mean, it's, it, the music business is like the tech business. And there's three companies that own everything. You know, it's Sony, Warner, and MCA, Universal. I mean, that's it. And they own everybody else that, you ever, that you'll ever hear of. And so that's the you know even the independent labels have to be dis distributed through something to do with that so you know we live in a, in a different world and the world i grew up in was um was was piloted by cowboys <laughs> guys that started labels and they didn't know that you couldn't and you know people would ask me and, and i've run my life like this and what i'm doing now at this very moment is an example of that and i always said this because people would ask me how did you how did you have a hit record? You know, you there's so many millions of people that were trying to have a hit. And I said, Well, what I did, I said, I asked him, Do you remember the cartoon with Wiley Coyote? Because he runs off the cliff and his feet is spinning. And he's out there over the cliff and there's nothing under him. But he doesn't fall until he looks down. Don't look down. Just don't look down. I mean, I, I didn't know you, and now we're buddies, and now you know, now Shannon knows my music and Chase knows my music and whoever's watching this is hopefully enjoying this conversation as half as much as I am and hope you are. But, you know, you just keep going. Yeah. What's the option? You'll be dead for a billion years. <laughs> you know, you're alive for what? It's not even a blip on, this, on, the, on whatever the great spirit is uh, on its radar. It's all nonsense. So go for it. What are they going? What are they going to do to me? Not give me a record deal? <laughs> I got. They're I got. I got to come in uh, uh, again. <laughs> well, I want to remind people that that uh, Henry and I this week and was just released last night. We did a, a track by track of his brand new album, "Too Clever for My Own Good," and you hear the, the the chorus of every song. And Henry talks about the stories behind every song. At the at the very top of the description of this video, you will see a link to Henry's website as well as. Uh, a link to that video where you can get a feel for the album, where you can pick it up. And just a few more questions before we have to wrap it up, because we're already over time, but we're having fun. Over time with me? I over never heard time. of such a thing. We're, <laughs> you know what? Someone had told us, it used to be just Shannon and I would be talking about, uh, you know, questions from, uh, uh, answering questions from, from viewers. And one guy put on there, he says, you know, you might just want to do an hour because you're wearing out your welcome. And I kind of felt like, well, you can turn it off. You, know, you can turn it off. Well, if we're going to do that, then I'm going to have to play every song and plug me into something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got, you got another question? Uh, <laughs> just a couple comments. I could listen to Henry play for hours. Thanks so much. This is great. Oh, oh man, thank you. Or girl, or whoever you are. Man, woman. In between, whatever you say you are, I agree. Just thank you. Uh, Henry, thank you. I thought this was going to be an interview. Instead, we got an intimate concert. Ah. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so kind. Great guitar playing. Oh. Yeah, you never look down at your guitar. You've just been playing that long, right? You just. You it's not a guitar. It's not a guitar. It's actually a recording, though. <laughs> 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 no, yeah, I, lo I, I love guitars. Great, great. That, you, go ahead. Yeah, oh, great that Henry is your guest tonight. Uh, Henry, the fans demanded it, and John delivered. John delivers. I'm telling you, John delivers. There you are, the man. You're the man. And, and he has the best shirt in the Western world tonight. He's hiding it because earlier. You know, it's a John Lennon shirt. John Lennon line. Almost all the shirts I wear on my videos are all from John Lennon's line. Well, may I say, with all in response, all the clothes I wear at every performance I do are from Lansky Brothers in Memphis, Tennessee. Hal and Julie Lansky, you know, their dad, Bernard Lansky, made all the clothes for my idol, Elvis Presley. Really? And they are still 
They are still uh, in, uh, they're on Beale Street and in the Peabody Hotel, and they make the clothes of rock. And as I say to them, uh, you know, uh, for those who rock, you know, it's Lansky's. You know, they, they, they do it. You know, they, they really have, they remade all the clothes that they had all the sketches and all the designs of the clothes that Bernard Lansky made for Elvis. So I just played in Memphis and I was wearing Elvis's wedding jacket. And they and I've got his I've got I've got a, an exact replica. Now this means a lot to me because Elvis, you know, blew my mind completely. And, and and maybe some people say, well, isn't that a little nerdy? Yeah, but I don't. Do I care? No. I've got the jacket he wore on the Tommy Dorsey show. I've got a gold lame jacket that's on the cover of this CD. Is courtesy. I mean, Hal Lansky gave me this jacket. I mean, Memphis. First of all, everybody I know in Memphis is great, but Lansky's. You go in there and, you know, you're going to be sorry because you're going to buy more stuff. You, you cannot walk out of Lansky's. They have no lame clothes in there. Wow. They got rock wow. and roll clothes. You I want the no blue sport? They got it. They, they made the stuff. They got a thing. It's What's it going to be called? They got a new jacket. I got I to gotta get one. It's mind-blowing. It's called a – what's the name of that? Uh, it's an Al Green song, Happy something uh, Anyway, they got a, it's a new jacket that he's got. I, I can't go there because you have to social. You have to social distance. You cannot. I gotta go have. There. Don't you dare. Yeah. I know it's it's I, it's it's so. I just love them. Okay, so Lansky's. There you are. You got Lennon. I got Lansky's. A few more. Um, Henry is great. Completely enjoyed this on a Friday night, and you just went on my bucket list. Oh. That is very kind. Yeah, it's a lot of really nice positive feedback tonight here, Henry. Oh, well, that's great, you know, because music is um, it's one of the few things we have left yeah. to, yeah. Not, to not divide us. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a wonderful, it's a miracle, really. I mean, that, that we, it, I mean, as much as I dislike technology, I'm not, you know, I, I really am an analog kind of guy. I mean, I'm always shocked that people come over and they go, hey, you can still sing. And, you know, <laughs> you had to be able to play and sing to get the job. You know, And a lot of st music is created in the studio. And there are a lot of great singers, too. There are a lot of fantastic singers. But, you know, we used to go in and just sing and play live. I mean, we do a couple of takes, two or three takes sometimes, you know, sometimes one take. I mean, my record, Simone, is one take. You know, just live. I mean, plugging into something is almost all live. And I'll, I'll never forget Tommy West saying to me, we were listening back to Southern Band, to the playback of it, and I, Tommy says to me, uh, says, you know that first Southern, when it goes like, mm -hmm. Southern, day, the Southern, was out of tune. It's a little sharp. And, I, and this is great. So Tommy said, well, you know, do you want to fix it? And I said, no, feels good. I don't care if it's a little sharp. Now, if you put a sharp note on your record, the music police come to your house. They take away your guitar for at least a week. You know, you know they, 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 it's unbelievable because your ears have been our ears are so trained yeah. to hearing things in time. And, in, you know, in, in, you know, a record should be in reasonably within time. But all the great hits that we grew up on, the tempos move. I mean, you want to put a clock to honky tonk women. That thing moves eight beats a minute. It's, but it feels great every second of it. Yeah. And, and But all of a sudden, tempo had to become something that was stationary. And, and you know, people say to me, man, you don't have to be like that. You just, just go sing it. Yeah, well, you go sing it. And everybody goes, when are you going to make the record? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Anyway, there's a little... Well, we're, uh, we've got... You know what? I, I uh, we got to wrap it up because uh, I have to do my radio show. You know, oh usually I come on here and I, I in the afternoon I go in and I record my radio show and I'm ready to roll. And uh, tonight I'm going, oh yeah, I, I record my show right in here. This is actually my studio, see? So this is this is where I do my stuff. Well, just let me say to what I always say to my friends and fans at the end of everything I do, because this is kind of like a show we did already. So I'll just say thank you very much for giving me the greatest gift anyone can ever give anyone else, let alone an artist, your time. Lucky yeah. me. Yeah. For the folks who are listening, I'll say it again. We did a, we released a video last night.
Henry Gross, John Bowden, talking about Henry's brand new album, Too Clever for My Own Good. You can hear every single last track on there. We play the chorus and the intros, and Henry talks about the inspiration behind them, funny little stories, a lot of great little stories. Uh, 17 tracks off this new album. In the description of this video, there's a link to that video. There's also a link to Henry's uh, website where you can pick it up, and it's available on streaming services. You can download it on Apple and all the regular streaming services, right? And if you, and, and a lot of us, I mean, 16 billion of us are out of work. If you haven't, I mean, really, I'm not getting rich or poor. When you when you buy the CD or you buy the downloads, you're buying me a nice drink. You're helping me keep the thing going. But if you can't, and God knows a million people can't, it's free everywhere. The songs are up on YouTube. Look at the picture on my on my Facebook page. Get the sequence of the songs. All I ask is that you listen to them in sequence because I'd like you to hear the sequence. But I don't care. They're free. They're on Spotify. They're wherever free music is available. It's not. It's too late to, to even think about, is, he gonna, is this going to make me rich? Am I going to make an extra tip? I don't care. Just <laughs> listen to the music. I want you to hear the music and enjoy it. And, uh, you know, and we'll, you know, I've, I never crowdfund. I think making records is a is a privilege. I'm not taking ten dollars from a guy who paints houses for a living because he wants to hear my record. I'll make it happen. Thank you very much. So we we're all smart people out here. We know what where the re, what the real answer is. The answer is I want you to hear the music. Thanks for making people aware of it. Love you, Henry. Thank you so much for your time. We so appreciate. It. We've got to have you back on. This has been really fun. Love the stories. We got a million of them. You ain't yeah. scratching. You ain't, as, uh, as uh, Al Jolson said, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks, good night to everyone. Henry, I'm going to talk to you tomorrow. I'll uh, send you a message tomorrow. And Thank uh, thanks a lot. Online? Will this be up online, this business? It's going to go online immediately. Oh, well, he, he's, we couldn't do it any quicker than that. What's the lag? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Everybody, thank you for... Thank you.